Fresh water is the lifeblood of steamships, but it's pretty hard to find in the middle of an ocean, so large amounts of it had to be continuously made to serve not only the boilers and steam system, but certainly the needs of a very large crew. Before we take a look at how that was done, I'm going to ask that you watch this video all of the way through, then click like to help us make some money. All earnings produced by you and others for the next 30 days will go directly to the ship for repairs that are currently taking place. So please give us about 16 minutes of your time, then click the like button. Thank you. Now let's take a look at how Battleship Texas made fresh water. As we walk aft along the starboard passage of the second deck, we approach the diagonal armor that forms up the back of the armored citadel. Uh, let's take a look though, and on the right hand side, you'll see a, a rather unassuming door that uh, if we open it, actually shows one of the more important systems on the ship. As we step into the room, we're going to see that it's dominated by three uh, rather large rounded tanks on one side uh, that are heavily insulated. And as we step around and look at the port side, we're going to see three more. These make up the freshwater evaporator system that was uh, required to make fresh water on the ship. Now, this was a critical thing on steamships. Even though they used what are called closed loop systems that reused uh, the water, uh, they had a lot of loss in it. And since uh, fresh water is pretty hard to find in the middle of the ocean, it meant that they had to make it. These were what were used to do it. This is called a triple effect system. Uh, the reason it's called a triple effect is that each one of these tanks is called an effect and the three of them hooked together are what produce fresh water. In this case, each this one system here creates up to 18,000 gallons of fresh water a day when in good operating shape. And back on the starboard side, there are three more that uh, tie together to make an identical system. So together they could produce up to 36,000 gallons of fresh water a day. Now we're gonna go ahead and get take a more detailed look at this, but before we do, I wanna stop and we're gonna just have a really quick discussion on producing steam and the temperatures and pressure required. Now it's not gonna be very painful and hopefully it won't last more than a, a minute or two. Pressure has everything to do with making evaporators work. This is because as pressure increases, so does water's vapor point or boiling temperature. Water on a stove boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but it increases to 228 degrees in a 20 pound pressure cooker. Going higher, the ship's boilers produce 417 degrees steam at 300 psi. Likewise, decreasing pressure decreases vapor point. If we put water in a near vacuum of one tenth of a pound per square inch, it will vaporize at only 36 degrees or 4 degrees above its freezing point. However, we're limiting our scale to a low of 3 psi and a high of 20 psi because that's the range in which the condensers worked. Okay, now that we have some idea of how this stuff worked, let's take a look at a few details. This is the first of the three effects for this particular system. Seawater was pumped into the lower part of it, and inside of that was a tube nest that uh, heated the water. Now, uh, 20 pound per square inch steam that was at a temperature of 200, uh, 228 degrees was pumped through the tube nest located inside, and it heated that seawater to 193 degrees. Now, that was enough to make it evaporate because that housing was only under 10 PSI or 10 pounds per square inch pressure, which allowed it to evaporate at a total of 193 degrees. Now, if you'll look, you'll see that there's a large pipe coming off of it, and it runs to the second effect, and it's pumped through that tube nest at 193 degrees. Now, the tank inside of that is pressurized at only seven PSI, and so that only uh, requires 177 degrees to vaporize the water. Now, since only part of the seawater in the first effect was, uh, was evaporated, that more concentrated seawater was pumped into this one. And so that's what uh, the vapor was taken off of. Again, if you look up here, I'm going to move around a little bit where you can see it. Steam accumulated off of that at uh, 177 PSI, entered the tube nest on the third effect. So uh, that's at a temperature of 177 degrees. Now this tank or effect is only pressurized at three pounds per square inch, meaning that that water will vaporize at 142 degrees. So what we have here is uh, the steam that comes off of it, then goes downstairs to the evaporator pump room, and uh, along with the other stages where it does some additional work that we'll talk about briefly when we go down there. 
Now the seawater that was pumped from the second effect into this one is uh, rather high in salt content, but fortunately it's not enough to deposit salts inside. But it's been used all that we want to use it, so it's now pumped overboard. Now let's uh, go downstairs and we're going to take a look at the evaporator pump room because there really isn't a whole lot to see here uh, when you look at the piping and the pumps and everything it took to run it. So we're going to go down there. We've now moved down uh, to the third deck level directly below the evaporator room. We're now in the evaporator pump room. This is where all the pipes and the machines necessary to make those evaporators work. And as I walk through, you're going to see that it's a pretty busy place. In fact, I don't think it would be inaccurate to say this is a plumber's dream. Anyway, the good news is, is its complexity is at least split up. Now that we're on the starboard side, we have basically a full system of pumps, uh, heaters, and um, piping that run the uh, starboard side the triple effect evaporators. And then on the other side is a duplicate of it. It's just kind of reversed, but it's exactly the same equipment. I'm going to just kind of loop around where we'll take a look at some of the major objects in it. Before we go any farther, I think it's pretty obvious that there's been a lot of vandalism in this room and of course there's failing paint. We're not so worried about the paint because uh, the equipment underneath is still in good shape and at some point of course that paint will be replaced. But you can also see on this gauge board that when you look underneath the paint, uh, the gauges have been heavily vandalized. That's not uncommon in this space at all. And the reason for that was that during the early days that the ship was here at San Jacinto, uh, back in the late 40s and through the 1950s, uh, this space was open to the public. And even then, vandalism was a serious problem. So that's uh, why most of these spaces are now closed off, just to prevent further damage. Well, let's start by looking at this large square tank here, this is the evaporator condenser. This is where the steam or vapor from the three effects came in and was converted into water. From there, it was pumped through these devices. These are called condenser air pumps. Now, there's two of them. There's this one on, uh, closest to us that feeds the system we're looking at, and then the other one over there feeds the uh, port system. The uh, name kind of belies the function in that this really isn't a pump, uh, air pump that pressurizes, but it, pr it puts a vacuum on it. And what that does is that sucks air out of the water. That's really not a good thing to have there. Up here is an air separation and test tank where water was sent. And it was here that they also checked for salinity because the last thing you want to find in the, that water is any salt. Okay, we're going to sweep back around, and in order to make this evaporator work, we need cooling water uh, that surrounds the coils that the water condenses in, and that's provided by this electric pump here. This is a circulating pump that pumps uh, seawater uh, over the evaporator coils to keep them cool and to, evaporate and to condense the water. Now behind it, in the back corner here, is the uh, brine discharge pump. All that salt water that goes through the evaporators and then is very uh, concentrated salt when it leaves it has to be basically thrown away. So this pump is what's used uh, to pump that salt water coming off of the uh, third effect overboard. We also have uh, the, uh, the uh, condenser circulating pumps here and this is what uh, helps move that uh, evaporator, or the uh, condensed fresh water over to the, uh, the uh, air pumps. Now one last thing is throughout this system you're going to see heavily insulated objects like that and there's a couple more in here. There's one that's not so insulated that's here and these are heaters. They scavenged as much of the heat as they could uh, basically coming off of uh, the, either the the uh, steam vapors from each effect and use that to preheat salt water between stages. This maximized the efficiency of the system. 
Now, of course, we've got all kinds of valves to where we can open and close and shut off effects and that kind of thing. But this kind of gives you an idea of the complexity of the system. And so what I'm going to do now is just shut it off, and we'll just show a quick graphic showing. Uh, it gives you a better uh, visual representation of not only how the effects worked, but also this machinery to support it. Here's an historic hand-drawn diagram of a triple effect evaporator that shows the array of pipes, pumps, heaters, and condensers that made up a complete system. Coloring the major components and pipe circuits helps clarify how things moved and contributed to the system's operation and efficiency. So this was a system that was installed during the 1925-26 modernization. There was uh, a previous uh, evaporator system installed on the ship uh, that was really old technology and not very efficient. That was torn out and this was put in its place again in 1925-26. Now what we're doing is we're walking forward on the third deck in the uh, port ammo passage. And the reason we're doing that is that uh, they installed an additional uh, system in 1943, sometime during the summer, so it was during World War II. Now the ship had much greater requirements for fresh water because of a larger crew size. They also wanted to be sure that they had adequate supplies uh, in case of battle damage. So what we're going to do is we're going to visit the emergency pump room, or I'm sorry, the emergency evaporator room that's right up here. We are currently standing in one of the forward crew berthing spaces on the port side of the ship. This was originally a coal bunker. Beneath us are fuel tanks. And what they did was they cleared out uh, tank B8P and uh, they basically lowered the fuel tank to open up a space on the first platform level. And that's where they put this emergency evaporator. Now we're going to go down there and take a look at it, but there's something else I want to show you first. One of the problems with these, this evaporator is you couldn't disassemble it enough to move it down the normal way. So what they had to do was they had to cut big openings all the way from the main deck down to here. And we can see that. You can see that big rectangular rust line there. That's where they cut the opening. They also cut the beams that supported it there and over there. So this is how they made the openings in the space large enough to get the evaporator down. They uh, again did the same thing on the second deck on the, on the, and on the main deck. So now let's go ahead. We're going to take, go down and take a look at the evaporator. So we've just come down this ladder and uh, in our position we can now see the face of what's called a Griscom Russell to effect solo shell evaporator. This is excellent World War II technology and it represents a tremendous step in progress from the original triple effect evaporators that are above. Now the reason this is called a two effect is because it only has two stages of evaporation rather than three. But even though it doesn't quite have the same efficiency, it was able to put out a pretty uh, significant amount of fresh water, uh, up to 12,000 gallons per day. Now it's called a solo shell because instead of having two shells or two separate effects, they're all located within a single drum. You can see it's pretty complicated. We're not going to try to walk through all of this. But uh, the water, uh, water was brought in, seawater, and just like the other uh, evaporators, then steam was brought in and the water was evaporated at two levels. If we walk around to the back of it, you can see some of the major steam piping that comes in and then also that exits to be sent to uh, condensers to evaporate. We also have a little test tank here where they can uh, take water out of it to analyze. We have temperature gauges actually all over the whole thing. We also have two sight glasses, one here and one here. And it's through those that you can look and uh, see if there's any kind of buildup of uh, contaminants on the outsides of the coils, which would greatly reduce their effectiveness. We also have here uh, a uh, water test tank, uh, water that was that came out of the uh, evaporator was sent into here, where they could check its uh, its quality, and they'd do this using this, this salinity meter. And if we look at it, let's see if we can zoom in and read that gauge. You can show that it shows uh, grains of sea salt per gallon, and then below that, 
all the different parts of the uh, evaporator system that could be switched over to check and see if there's any contamination where it might uh, come from. And lastly, there are five boxes or enclosures that contain motor controllers that control the different pumps, whether it's uh, seawater injection or discharge overboard or the uh, fresh water that's uh, sent uh, out, of the, out of the space. Now, this evaporator was actually a pretty darn popular device because units that are practically identical to it were the primary means of getting fresh water on smaller warships like uh, destroyers and destroyer escorts. And uh, from, all, uh, from what we can gather, the uh, engineering staff really liked this unit. It's pretty complicated, but frankly, so is all, are all of them. And what they would have really liked would have been to have torn the uh, big primary system out and put a number of these in. But that didn't happen simply because uh, uh, the battleship Texas was an older ship and they knew that it was going to be decommissioned with, as soon as the war was over. So there wasn't any point in tying it up for weeks, if not months, to change all this out. Thank you very much if you've made it this far. Now if you would, please click the like button to help generate as much income as possible and help with the repair and restoration of this incredible ship.